Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us um, for this Stanford's Maternal and Child Health Research Institute monthly seminar. This month, we have a very exciting uh, lineup with Michelle Manja and Juliet Knowles, uh, which we'll, we get to in a second. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us. And um, uh, wanted to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. This is an amazing seminar, but we have a whole lineup for the rest of the year on our website, which I invite you to uh, to look at, including uh, next month, um, March 22nd, is our annual MCHRI Biodesign um, monthly seminar, which we basically highlight some of the best of the, of the new Biodesign Fellow um, discoveries. So please don't miss that. And then on April 5th, Gary Darmstadt is going to talk about topics on gender inequalities and community health um, from his work. Um, so these are some of the ones that are coming up in the next couple months. But uh, please look at the website for uh, there's something for everyone in these monthly seminar series. Next slide. Wanted to highlight now our fall symposium, which will be uh, virtually right now, but perhaps virtual and in person as a hybrid on Thursday, October 28th. Um, and we're really excited to announce the keynote speaker, who's um, Kelly Moley, who's the Deputy Director of Reproductive Health Technologies at the Gates Foundation, really has a lot to say about about reproductive technologies, maternal health, and uh, global health as well. So please don't miss that. Uh, we'll be putting out a call for abstracts for submission. Um, and so please uh, mark that on your calendar for the fourth annual symposium on um, Thursday, October 28th. And then um, this is our education committee. I want to thank them again for all the work they do putting on this symposium and this seminar series, as well as uh, their Eureka uh, um, mentorships. Um, courses. So if you have any questions or want to join this, um, please let us know. Um, and then next slide, we're going to send you a survey as always after this talk. So please give us your feedback and any suggestions you have about the monthly seminar series and any uh, suggestions for speakers that um, you might think of. So um, so now I wanted to really turn it over to um, Dr. Michelle Manja and uh, Juliet Knowles. Michelle is this associate professor of neurology and neurological sciences at Stanford, a recipient of a faculty MCHRI faculty award, um, the Institute for Stem Cell Biology Regenerative Medicine Award and the Spark Award, um, really a pioneer in, in neuro neurologic and oncology as well as now you'll see um, neurodevelopment as well. Um, and she'll be paired with Juliet Knowles who's an instructor, uh, recently started her lab um, and uh, in neurology and neurological sciences. And together they're gonna talk about uh, this uh, brain plasticity and activity dependent myelination and how it has a big effect um, in epilepsy. So um, Michelle and Juliet, uh, please take it away. Just wanted to remind you, um, there's a, on the lower right hand corner of the Zoom, there's a Q&A um, function. Uh, as always, um, I know you're not shy, so, you, so please add in as many questions as possible and I'll moderate at the end. So, um, so Michelle, um, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to give induction to this concept of active myelination. And I like to begin really all talks with a broad consideration of nervous system development. And I, I think the best way to do that is to show you pictures of my children. So this is my daughter, Sophie, when she was a newborn. Um, a human nervous system development is so amazing and so enormous that we made Sophie checklist onesie so she could track of all of her neurodevelopmental to-dos in every day. And it's really, when you think about it, human infants undergo just such a, a mind-boggling amount of neurodevelopmental and develop every day. Um, they undergo something on the order of um, 500 billion synapses. Did. They make 14,000 new hippocampal neurons every day in the first year of life, 127 million new cerebellar granule cell neurons every day in the first year of life. But perhaps the most um, enormous task that human infants have is to myelinate their central nervous system. 
Myelination is this fascinatingly protracted process in the human nervous system spanning more than 30 years of neurodevelopment. Uh, we are born with almost no myelin. Myelination really occurs in the postnatal period. At the time of birth, there is um, some myelin that begins around the central sulcus and progresses towards the poles of the brain that begins in the um, cervical spinal cord and then progresses down the core. This is why human infants can hold up their head ahead of um, bringing their hands together as myelination progresses down the cervical cord by six months can sit as myelination reaches the thoracic cord and then by a year as myelination of the cord progresses towards the lumbosacral region can, can walk. In general, this period of myelination as it extends over, um, you know, all of childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood, um, you know, involves the myelination first of more basic circuitry, such as that involved in, in sensation and in movement, and then later uh, more complex circuitry, um, such as higher cognitive function. Fascinatingly, though, this, this process of myelination, this process by which oligodendrocytes Dendrocytes in sheath axonal membranes to decrease transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction. Um, it doesn't finish at the at the end of development. We we now understand and perhaps have understood for some time that um, in the neocortex and intercortical association fibers, there is ongoing accumulation of myelin throughout the lifespan. And um, we now know from, um, you know, more recent um, in vivo imaging studies from rodents that, that there is indeed new oligodendrogenesis, um, new oligodendrocyte generation, and new myelin production, particularly in the neocortex. And so, you know, this ongoing myelination um, throughout life really begs several important basic questions, such as, you know, what regulates the proliferation and functional differentiation of oligodendroglial lineage cells, of the myelin-forming cell precursors? Well, one idea that's been in the literature for some time, actually introduced in the early 90s by Ben Barris, by our own Ben Barris, um, back when he was a postdoctoral fellow, is the idea that neurons themselves may regulate the extent to which their axons are myelinated, and that this could be happening in an activity and experience dependent way. Um, that was then, that idea was then supported by a number of really beautiful in vitro and correlational studies, um, but it remained a very controversial topic in the myelin field in part because there are also quite clearly activity independent modes of myelination. And so when I started my lab here at Stanford now nearly 10 years ago, one of the first questions that we set out to answer is can neuronal activity regulate myelination in awake behaving um, mammals, is myelin plastic and adaptable? And so I want to just introduce you very quickly um, to this idea of adaptive myelination, of experience and activity dependent changes to myelin and the myelinated infrastructure of the nervous system that we believe promotes um, normal, healthy brain and um, overall neurological function. And then I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Juliet Knowles, who is going to tell you about disease context in which adaptive myelination can become maladaptive. And so to answer the question of whether neuronal activity influences um, uh, myelination, we turn to some, uh, uh, you know, now very commonly used, um, but at the time more novel, uh, in vivo neuroscience techniques, such as in vivo optogenetics. And so in vivo optogenetics allows for um, control of uh, neuronal activity using light in targeted neuronal populations that express a light sensitive opsin. So this is blue light sensitive channel word opsin two expressed in cortical projection neurons. Um, and if we then deliver blue light to the um, motor planning area or M2 cortex in an optogenetically stimulatable mouse, here you see this guy um, executing complex motor behavior in response to stimulation of um, premotor motor planning area cortical projection neurons. And so in this mouse model, we can then in a, in a um, really quite straightforward way ask questions about how changes in neuronal activity activity um, in cortical prediction neurons influences myelination. And what we found is that by stimulating these cortical projection neurons, there was a rapid and robust increase in the proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells, quite specifically within the stimulated 
um, circuit in the corticocolossal circuit. If we fate map these cells over time, we find that these proliferating oligodendrocytes generate, sorry, the pro proliferating oligodendrocyte precursor cells then generate new oligodendrocytes, and that this results in a change in myelin ultrastructure that we would expect may influence neural circuit dynamics and therefore neurological function. And what we found was that indeed these changes in the premotor circuit um, resulted in um, improvements in mouse motor functional behavior that depended upon the generation of new oligodendrocytes. And so one um, molecular hypothesis uh, is, is that these you know, robust and really powerful rapid neuron glial interactions may be regulated through, through at least in part through activity regulated um, release of the neurotrophin brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, and so we tested this molecular hypothesis using two different genetic mouse models, one in which there's impaired um, activity regulated secretion and release of BDNF from neurons, and a second mouse model in which we conditionally and inducibly delete the BDNF receptor TREC B just from oligodendrocyte precursor cells and in an inducible way at various points in postnatal development. And what we found is that using both of these mouth mouse models, when we optogenetically stimulate neural activity, um, that there is a complete loss of the activity regulated response in mice that either lack activity regulated BDNF or that lack um, OPC specific expression of TREC B. As there's no activity regulated OPC proliferation, generation of new oligodendrocytes, it stands to reason that there's also no change in activity regulated myelin structure in these mice that have deficient BDNF to track B signaling. I want to point out, though, that in the OPC specific deletion of um, track B model, that there's ongoing homeostatic myelination. So here we're specifically impairing activity regulated changes in myelin. And this gives us a molecular handle to begin to ask what role um, activity dependent myelination plays in various forms of neurological function, and then as you'll hear later in disease. And one set of tests that we did of cognitive function showed quite clearly that loss of activity dependent myelination influences normal cognitive function. So for example, in, in one behavioral test, um, the novel object recognition test where we place a mouse in a chamber with two identical objects, it gets to know those objects. And then after we um, take the mouse out, we can replace one object and a healthy mouse will spend a little more time with the novel versus the familiar object if it remembered what it had seen before. And what we find is that if mice have lost activity dependent myelination through postnatal deletion of um, the TREC B receptor from OPCs, either in the juvenile period or later on in early adulthood, that there is a lack of um, ability to discriminate between these two objects. Um, that suggests a, an impairment in attention and short-term memory function. And so this emerging concept of plasticity of myelin, plasticity of the myelinated infrastructure of the brain has an, a number of implications in health um, as well as in disease. So for example, um, we now understand that at least in preclinical models and rodent models that um, activity dependent myelination is, is required Required for certain forms of motor learning, for attention and short-term memory function, for memory consolidation. And that the mechanisms involved, at least in cortical projection neurons, involve um, intact BDNF to track B signaling. Now, while that may not be the entire mechanism, it is one required part of the mechanism. There are these really fascinating synapses that form between neurons and oligodendroglial cells. The role that those play in activity-dependent myelination is, is just now becoming coming to light. But what is clear is that when new oligodendrocytes are generated, they modulate the myelinated infrastructure by myelinating previously unmyelinated axons or previously unmyelinated segments of axons. They can also remodel existing my, myelin sheaths. And together, these, these even subtle changes in, in myelination promotes coordinated network function. Um, electrophysiological studies have shown that, that activity-dependent myelination in the healthy brain promotes coordination of circuits, promotes network synchrony. And there are you know, a, a range of implications of dysregulated or disrupted myelination in disease. So for example, if adaptive 
myelination is important in normal cognitive function, it stands to reason that loss of adaptive myelination may play important roles in cognitive dysfunction. And indeed, we have found that um, in mouse models of chemotherapy-induced cognitive impairment, that loss of adaptive myelination is one really critical component. On another side of the spectrum, we've also found that malignant hijacking of these mechanisms in uh, brain cancers very much like oligodendrocyte precursor cells um, that we think arise from oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Um, these same neuron glial interactions drive malignant growth of childhood gliomas. And then finally, what happens when this adaptive process that promotes network synchrony instead becomes maladaptive? And this is a question that Juliet Knowles um, has, been, has been working to answer. Um, first in, in my lab together with um, John Huguenard in a collaborative project and now in her own independent lab. So it's my pleasure to transition over to Juliet and, and have Juliet take over the talk and tell us about her really exciting work in the role of maladaptive myelination in Afson's epilepsy. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, give me a moment, I'll share my slides. Okay, great. Can you see the slides? Looks good. Great. Okay, well, so as Michelle alluded to, um, I'm gonna give you uh, another story about um, activity-dependent myelination and how myelination might play an unexpected role in pediatric epilepsy. So I wanna start by saying thank you, Michelle, for that uh, beautiful introduction and overview of activity-regulated myelination. Um, and as you might've gathered from Michelle's talk, um, her laboratory essentially pioneered this discovery, this amazing discovery of in vivo activity-regulated myelination and its importance in uh, some cognitive functions. And thanks to her lab's pioneering work and now others that have in many ways replicated those findings, we now understand that in the normal healthy brain, activity regulated myelination is adaptive. It's helpful for multiple cognitive functions. And we think that myelin plasticity supports these cognitive functions by increasing neuronal network synchrony. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So in the brain, Parts of the brain that are regionally separated from each other must often work together in distributed networks to achieve these complex functions. And these separated regions are connected by white matter connections. And when those connections become more heavily myelinated, the communication between these regions becomes um, more coordinated and thus the regions become more synchronized. So Michelle, um, showed us how, at least in one example, for example, uh, chemotherapy-induced cognitive impairment, loss of this coordinating, synchronizing function of um, adaptive myelination, how that loss can lead to cognitive impairment. But I have a slightly different question, um, which is sort of the reverse, which is, what is it possible that ongoing active activity-dependent myelination could, in some cases, contribute to disease states. And that question is particularly relevant in disease states that are defined by abnormal patterns of neuronal activity, diseases such as epilepsy. So epilepsy is a collection of diseases that is defined by the enduring predisposition to have unprovoked seizures. And seizures can be captured on an EEG, as shown here. And we think that underlying that enduring predisposition is pathological neuronal network hypersynchrony. And diffusion imaging studies have demonstrated white matter abnormalities in multiple forms of epilepsy, although the exact nature of those structural changes and their functional significance are unknown. So I wondered, could seizures induce aberrant activity-dependent myelination within the seizure network? And if so, what impact might that um, aberrant myelination have on resulting um, continued disease pathology? So today, I'm gonna uh, tell you about, about my work 
um, and how a certain type of seizure, absent seizures, promote abnormally increased myelination within the seizure network. And that this aberrant activity dependent myelination in turn promotes further seizure progression. And I'll share with you my hypothesis that this aberrant myelination may promote seizure progression by promoting pathological neuronal network hypersynchrony. Therefore, maladaptive myelination may be a novel pathogenic mechanism in epilepsy and other diseases. So I'm studying myelination in the context of absence seizures. These are very common. They occur in multiple forms of pediatric generalized epilepsy. And the seizures are outwardly manifest with very brief but frequent um, behavioral arrests. They're essentially staring spells in which the child is not responsive and typically there's impairment of consciousness. And when captured on EEG, the correlate is a generalized spike wave discharge pattern. Now, the first line treatment for these is often ethosuximide. And we have animal models that recapitulate many key features of epilepsy with absent seizures, including two that I'll talk about today, wag rats and SCN8A mutant mice. Absence seizures arise from abnormal interactions between this deep gray structure, the thalamus, and the cortex. And in rodents, the seizures are most prominent in the uh, connections between the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex. But seizures are far less prominent more posteriorly in the brain. Importantly, seizures generalize, the absence seizures generalize, that is rapidly cross to the other side of the brain, by propagating across this major myelinated tract, the corpus callosum. Now, an interesting feature of these models of absence epilepsy is that they have well-defined periods of seizure onset and progression. So for example, SCNA day mutant mice bear a loss of function mutation in the voltage-gated sodium channel, NAV 1.6. And this leads them to spontaneously develop thalamocortical network hypersynchrony and absence seizures. And the seizures are pretty analogous to what we see in humans. The mice have behavioral arrests with a generalized spike wave discharge correlate on EEG. And the onset of seizures is at postnatal day 21 or P21. But at that point, the seizures are pretty infrequent. However, over this ensuing period of seizure progression, the seizures ramp up in their frequency so that they're happening many times, on average about 20 times per hour by the time the mice are 45 days old. Similarly, another model that I'm using, wag rye rats is an inbred rat strain that has spontaneous onset of absence seizures beginning at two months of age, but at that point, the seizures are infrequent and they subsequently ramp up so that the rats are having many seizures per hour, about 20 per hour by the time they're six months old, and then the seizures plateau. So given everything that Michelle and I have told you, my hypothesis is that absent seizures induce aberrant activity-dependent myelination in the thalamocortical seizure network, and that this aberrant myelin plasticity in turn contributes to further seizure progression by promoting underlying neuronal network hypersynchrony. So to test my hypothesis, I began by uh, looking at myelin forming cells of the brain, the oligodendrocytes. And I looked in um, a region of the corpus callosum that interconnects the somatosensory cortices where seizures are maximal. And these are representative photomicrographs showing uh, mature oligodendrocytes, which co-express olig2 in green and CC1 in red. And we observed that in these um, wag rye rats with well-established seizures, there appear to be more of these oligodendrocytes um, than in age-matched control rats. So we quantified these cells with the gold standard method of unbiased stereology. That is the gold standard method for counting cells in brain tissue. And prior to seizure onset, there was no difference in oligodendrocyte number. But when seizures were well established, there was a significant increase in colossal oligodendrocytes. And I don't have time to show you all the data, but we also found a seizure related uh, increase in OPC proliferation. So given those cellular changes, I wanted to know if myelin structure was also abnormal. So I used the gold standard method for looking at myelin, which is electron microscopy. And I looked in the same region of the corpus callosum. So 
These electron micrographs are a mid-sagittal view of the um, corpus callosum, and we're looking at axons and cross-section. So each of these is an axon with um, its myelin sheath surrounding it, this dark area. And we noticed that some of the axons in these rats with well-established seizures appeared to have thicker myelin sheaths compared to controls. So we quantified myelin thickness with the standard metric, which is the G ratio, defined as the um, axon diameter over the diameter of the axon and its myelin sheath, so that a lower G ratio indicates thicker myelin sheath per axon diameter. And we found that prior to seizure onset, there was no difference in G ratio. But once seizures were well established, G ratio was significantly decreased, indicative of thicker myelin sheaths per axon diameter. And this is the same data, simply shown a slightly different way. So in these scatter plots, each dot represents one axon with its G ratio plotted as a function of axon diameter. And the distribution of black dots representing axons from control animals perfectly overlaps the distribution of axons from seizure animals prior to seizure onset. There's no difference. However, after seizures are well established, the distribution of G ratios from the seizure axons is shifted downward, indicative of thicker myelin sheets. So I wanted to know if these myelin changes were specific for the seizure network. So I looked in a region of the brain where seizures are far less prominent and in the splenium of the corpus callosum. And there we found no difference in G ratio confirming that this observed increase in callosal myelination is in fact specific for the seizure network. So then I wondered whether these myelin changes might just be some idiosyncratic feature of Wagrai rats or if it was more generalizable than that. So I looked in a completely separate distinct model of absent seizures, scna a mutant mice. And similar to what we found in the rats, in these mice, we found um, an, a decrease in G ratio indicative of thicker myelin once seizures are well established, but not before. And interestingly, we also found um, an increase in the number of colossal myelinated axons in association with seizures in these mice. So, Having um, shown then um, this really interesting temporal association between seizures and increased um, colossal myelination within the seizure network in two distinct models of absence epilepsy, I then wondered, are the seizures actually causing those changes? So I decided to block the seizures with ethosuximide and um, see what impact that had on myelin structure. So we took control and, and seizure rats, and we treated them with either the vehicle or the drug ethosuximide, starting prior to seizure onset and throughout the period of seizure progression. And we monitored these rats with EEG. And as expected, vehicle-treated rats had very frequent seizures, and ethosuximide significantly reduced seizures. So if we block the seizures, what impact does that have on myelin structure? Well. As we saw previously, vehicle-treated rats with very frequent seizures had decreased G ratios indicative of thicker myelin sheaths. However, blockade of seizures with ethosuximide normalized G ratio, indicating that absence seizures are necessary for this increase in colossal myelination. So now that we've shown that seizures are both necessary and sufficient to induce increased myelination within the seizure network, I wanted to know the functional significance of this. And I postulated that this um, abnormal increase in myelination in the seizure network might serve to reinforce or cement in pathological patterns of neuronal activity, perhaps even promoting further seizures. So to test that idea, I decided to genetically block activity-dependent myelination in these SCNA day seizure mice. And to do that, I capitalized on the discovery that Michelle described for us, that um, BDNF signaling through its receptor, track B on OPCs, is required for activity-dependent myelination. So I crossed SCNA mutant mice with mice in whom the track B receptor can be selectively deleted from OPCs, but not other cell types, such as neurons. And this can be accomplished um, by treatment with tamoxifen. So we treated all of these mice with tamoxifen 
but only those expressing the protein CRE subsequently underwent OPC-specific deletion of the track B receptor. And I then wanted to confirm that um, deletion of the track B receptor from OPC specifically would block the myelin response to seizures. So I did electron microscopy on these mice. And <clears throat> as, as we saw previously, um, SCNA mice with seizures and normal expression of track B on their OPCs had decreased G ratios. However, when we deleted track B from OPCs, G ratios were normalized. So this was very exciting because this means that we now have a molecular tool with which we can block seizure-induced myelination, and therefore we can determine the impact of this aberrant activity-dependent myelination upon network function. So we implanted these mice for um, EEG and monitored their seizures over time. And we saw that uh, mutant mice with intact activity-dependent myelination, shown in red, had a steady increase, a progression in their seizures over time. However, mice that had impaired activity-dependent myelination, shown in blue, had many fewer seizures over time. And this indicates that activity-dependent myelination somehow sculpts the activity of neuronal networks in a way that promotes seizure progression. And this was a little bit of a paradigm shifting idea that myelination could so um, fundamentally alter the activity and modulate the activity of neuronal networks. And to my knowledge, this is the first demonstration um, of maladaptive myelination in epilepsy or really any other neurological disease. So I was very excited about this discovery. And as a physician scientist, of course, I. Um, thought very quickly about uh, potential clinical translation. And I thought about the patients, the pediatric patients that I meet in my clinic every week who are newly diagnosed with absence or other seizures. And I also thought about my patients whose seizures are refractory to medications, first line seizure medications, which primarily target neuronal mechanisms. So I wondered if we could give a drug that would block myelin plasticity. Is that even conceivable? And if we could, would it be helpful to give such a drug after seizures start? Because of course, patients come to us when their seizures have already started. We don't treat seizures preemptively. Well, there is a class of drugs that can block myelin plasticity, histone deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC inhibitors. OPCs must undergo epigenetic changes to fully differentiate into myelinating oligodendrocytes. And HDAC inhibitors block those changes, thereby preventing oligodendrogenesis. And in fact, the Manje lab had already demonstrated that a certain HDAC inhibitor, trichostatin A or TSA, can block activity-dependent myelination in their optogenetic stimulation paradigm that Michelle showed us. So with clinical relevance in mind, I turned back to my SCNA day mice. These mice have seizures beginning at postnatal day um, 21. So we took a group of these mice and we let them have uncontrolled progressing seizures for one week. We then initiated treatment with the HDAC inhibitor, TSA, or vehicle. And we treated them every day for two and a half weeks throughout this period of seizure progression up until the time of seizure plateau at P45. And as expected, just prior to treatment, the mice were having very frequent seizures. However, after two weeks of treatment, the mice that had received TSA had um, significantly fewer seizures than vehicle-treated mice. So this was a very exciting proof of concept that pharmacological blockade of myelin plasticity um, can, can um, decrease seizure progression. So having demonstrated then by both genetic and pharmacological blockade that myelin plasticity promotes seizure progression, a big question is how. how what, what properties does um, myelin plasticity impart upon this network um, that, that leads to more seizures? Well, we know that in the normal healthy state, activity-dependent myelination supports cognition by 
increasing neural network synchrony. So my hypothesis is that seizure-induced activity-dependent myelination promotes pathological neuronal network hypersynchrony. And I'm looking at network synchrony with a number of methods, um, one of which is EEG coherence. EEG coherence is a measure of functional connectivity, which essentially quantifies how correlated brain activity is in different regions. So for example, here is a schematic of a mouse brain showing how I implant um, pairs of interhemispheric EEG recording electrodes. So here's a pair in motor cortex, a pair in somatosensory cortex. These are regions where absent seizures are very prominent. And here's another pair in visual cortex where seizures are far less prominent. And of course, each of these pairs is anatomically connected by the corpus callosum, which is where I showed you all of the histology changes in myelin. So we can record brain activity from each of these pairs as shown here with the EEG. And whether you are a professional EEG reader slash EEG fanatic like me or not, I think there are some um, intuitive properties of these EEG signals that you can appreciate just by looking at it. First of all, um, there are interictal periods that are free of seizures, and then there are ictal periods during the seizures. Second of all, the EEG signal is composed of a, a mix of oscillations that are occurring at different frequencies. So there are some slow waves here, but superimposed on these slow waves are faster frequency oscillations. Um, and finally, I think that you can appreciate just by looking at these pairs that within each pair, activity is correlated, but it is not perfectly synchronous. Um, so we can quantify the degree of correlation or coherence within each pair. So for example, here is another example of a somatosensory cortex interhemispheric pair. And we can take these EEG signals and resolve them into their component frequencies mathematically. And we can plot the coherence between these two signals within each frequency over time. So this is a coherence plot of this very recording here. And we have a beautiful positive control. This is a generalized absence seizure, which by definition is a hypersynchronous, highly coherent event. And corresponding to that seizure in this coherence plot, you see this jump in, in yellow coloring here, which indicates higher coherence. And this occurs within the seizure frequency bands. But I'm actually more interested in this interictal period because I would like to know the impact of myelin changes upon resting baseline EEG coherence. And my hypothesis is that SCNA mice with seizures and intact activity-dependent myelin plasticity will have abnormally increased interictal EEG coherence, but that myelin plasticity blockade will help to normalize EEG coherence. So in summary, uh, today, Michelle and I together have told you a story about adaptive myelination, a newly appreciated and vital form of brain plasticity. However, um, activity-dependent myelination can also become maladaptive. For example, absent seizures can also induce increased myelination within the seizure network. And this aberrant activity-dependent myelination in turn contributes to seizure progression. Therefore, this maladaptive myelination may be a novel disease mechanism in epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And um, this work has led to a number of interesting questions, which are my uh, current and future directions. So first of all, all of the histology data that I showed you um, was from the corpus callosum, but I would like to map myelination patterns throughout the vast thalamocortical network that gives rise to absence seizures and in other brain networks. And I'm lucky um, to be collaborating with Dr. Jennifer McNabb in radiology and Gustavo Chow, who's a very talented student in her lab, um, to use MRI methods to achieve this. So specifically, we're using magnetization and diffusion-based MRI techniques to very precisely map myelination patterns um, and myelination structure within seizure networks, um, as precise, in fact, as G ratios. So um, 
These are estimates of G ratios that we've made with MRI in seizure mice and wild type mice. And we replicated our finding that G ratio is decreased um, in association with seizures with the MRI. And in fact, we actually validated these findings from MRI with electron microscopy from the very same brains. And I think that these uh, imaging techniques are gonna be really helpful and important because I suspect that when we get a look at myelination at the network level, it's likely to be far more complex than simply globally increased myelination. I suspect we'll find that some um, projections are reinforced with myelination, whereas others are more diminished. Also, longitudinal imaging will enable us to determine whether myelination is dynamic over the course of the disease. Perhaps it changes from the early stages to the late stages of disease. And we can also determine whether maladaptive myelination is reversible. And finally, there's the exciting possibility of correlating network level structural changes with functional measures. A second um, direction is that I plan to investigate whether there are molecular mechanisms that are unique to maladaptive versus adaptive myelination, because if so, these would be um, potential therapeutic targets. Another really important question is whether blocking myelin plasticity and epilepsy will help or hurt cognition. Because as Michelle and I have told you throughout the talk, myelin plasticity is critical for cognition. So of course you would ask, well, maybe blocking it will be harmful. But I think it's also important to consider that cognitive impairment is an extremely frequent uh, comorbidity of epilepsy and maladaptive myelination may contribute to that. So it may be that the net effect of preventing those maladaptive changes will be to help. So these are important experiments that we'll be doing. And finally, uh, the epilepsies are really a collection of distinct diseases and they are distinguished by multiple factors, including the type of seizure involved, the location of the seizure in the brain, uh, the age at which the seizures start, um, the frequency and severity of the seizures, the degree of neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation involved in different types of epilepsy. So each of those factors may influence the ultimate myelination phenotype, and I look forward to defining those phenotypes and their functional impacts in the years to come. And so with that, I just want to say um, thank you to you all for your attention. I want to say um, a sincere thank you to Michelle for um, host for for having us um, and and giving such a wonderful introduction. I also want to thank um, my other mentor on the project, John Huguenard, um, who's um, just been a wonderful neurophysiology mentor, and it's been really fun to um, work with him and think about uh, network synchrony. I want to thank my funding sources, which includes the Stanford um, MCHRI. And of course, the trainees, staff, and colleagues that have uh, helped me with this work along the way. And I'll just close by saying that uh, the newly forming Knowles Lab is opening for business. This is our new location. And uh, we have a beautiful lab space um, and a core already of very talented and friendly people. So. Uh, any students out there that are interested in what we've talked about today or simply want to discuss a career in science and medicine, please don't hesitate to contact me. All right, thank you very much. That was amazing, Michelle and Juliet. Um, uh, I'll just um, also emphasize, um, please contact Juliet if you are a trainee and would like to come a uh, beautiful space for her um, uh, and a great mentor. So. Um, please do that. Um, I wanted to invite um, folks on the call, on the Zoom to um, uh, add questions to the Q&A part. Um, while you're doing that, um, I will ask a couple um, ones that are burning. Um, a, a general um, overview, so your data suggests in terms of attenuated myelination that um, it could be either the activity or the myelination that causes the epilepsy or, yeah. or enhances the epilepsy. And yeah. in terms of the genetics and the biology, you know, which is, which do you think is, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Or yeah. are they both implicated? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, probably along with most other uh, epileptologists that the seizures are initiated by changes in neurons. Uh, 
that's how the seizures start. Um, and, um, and that this, and that this aberrant activity of neurons gives rise to the myelin plasticity that we observed and that that compounds the seizures. Um, so this is sort of a, another dimension of network plasticity that we didn't really appreciate before that contributes to the disease process. Okay, so, but you're letting the myelin um, off the hook here. Could it be, could there be um, um, abnormal myelination in response to activity that um, is actually um, causing this as well? Your model would suggest that there could be alleles that are um, super sensitive to activity oh. that, that are happening in the, in the in the OPCs. I see. So, um, so you're asking if there might be genetic impacts on how plastic the myelin itself is? Right. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. I mean, um, I think, you know, one key experiment we did was to block seizures to show that the seizures are necessary um, for the myelin changes. But I, I do think, you know, that a lot of epilepsy genes um, that have been identified, we've studied their role in neurons and how they change neurons, but not how they change neuroglial interactions. Um, so that's a great question to be investigated. Great. So um, I think, so one question that's coming up is about, um, so a general question is why, like what's happening as the, as the mice age, as the two mouse models, mm -hmm. um, and how is age affecting the severity of the myelin changes? And is that understood? Um, is that a developmental thing? Is that, I mean, there's obviously a mutation in the SCN8, but what else is bringing on the, the myelination? Yeah, so um, so I, I guess kind of the, the question, um, so, so basically, um, you know, the, the, an interesting feature that we talked about is that the seizures increase over time. Um, and uh, I don't think we fully know why that happens. And so that's why this effect of myelination is, is so interesting. It seems that it's contributing to that period of, of progression. Um, so, um, so I think that's, um, that's why, you know, the seizures are changing with, or that's one reason why the seizures are changing with age in the mice. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to look at what happens in the late stage of the disease. We might um, find more of a degenerative uh, phenotype and that too could influence myelin in different ways. So that's another, you know, study that I, I hope to do in the future. Yeah. Um, question is about, can the activity generated in myelin be used to help remyelination for um, obviously um, on the other end of the spectrum? Yeah, uh, that's a, a wonderful question. And um, yes, I, I don't that. Yeah. That. yeah, so we've, we've studied that as, as has others. Um, and we, yes, it can be um, used to leverage. You can leverage the activity itself, or you can leverage the mechanisms that underlie activity dependent myelination. So both increasing activity within a circuit promotes remyelination, and that's been shown optogenetically, as well as using other methods to um, regulate neuronal activity. In addition to that, just promoting um, OPC TREC B stimulation can um, promote remyelination after demyelinating injury, at least in um, uh, you know preclinical mouse models of, of demyelination. Yeah, and kind of a related question is um, how much activity dependent myelination does it take to actually um, perpetuate these um, the the network connectedness? Um, you know, um, is it one um, OPC, I mean, like how much do you need to, to get the, the, the amazing um, increase in, in, um, in epileptic um, activity? Could you, could you answer that question with the, um, with the mice, with the, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, that's a really um, great question. Um, the, the, the magnitude of the G ratio changes that we saw is actually, you know, sort of numerically sort of small, but actually with that's, it's actually a pretty big change within the dynamic range of, of G ratio, you know, somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8 in, in uh, animals. So um, I think that um, we're, you know, we saw that the seizures induced a pretty dramatic change in, in myelin um, and I think you know we'll have to figure out uh, how much we have to modulate myelin plasticity to um, 
decrease seizure progression? Uh, that's, that's a really good question, especially thinking about clinical translation. Yeah, so then getting back to the HDAC question, mm -hmm. um, um, obviously there's, there's a lot of other side effects of HDACs. Um, um, mm -hmm. Can you, is it a one-time treatment or do you have to keep on it? Um, if you know, um, can you give them like, you know, once a week or do you have a mm -hmm. sense, um, you know, on yeah. Sundays, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the HDAC inhibitor experiment was really um, an exciting proof of concept. Uh, we just, we wanted to show that we could give a drug to block myelin plasticity. And so, and yes, HDAC inhibitors have a range of um, toxicities associated with them. So um, I, in some ways, I'm a little bit more excited about looking into novel molecular mechanisms that are more specific for the disease process that we could target. Um, that being said, I think I'm also kind of you know, you can envision that there might be different regimens um, and, and scenarios in which you would want to block maladaptive myelination. Maybe, you know, you would give it for a short time to sort of prevent seizure progression while you give, you know, while you get the seizures under control. Um, or, um, you know, you might be able to sort of use a lower dose of the therapeutic in combination with some synergistic neuron mechanism targeted therapies. Right. So we have two questions, more a more clinical um, part of the questions. One is um, talk a little bit more about the the treatment at Stanford and the um, the epileptic cent the center that you're developing or have as well. And um, is there a resource for parents with rare types of epilepsy, um, more refractory types, um, and and your suggestions for how to, those parents to get um, you know seen or helped? And then also. Um, uh, how is it possible that it can start at age 14 or 15 without any symptoms from childhood? Like all of a sudden like that, and is that possible? Those are sort of two related on the, on the clinical end. I'll start with the first question. Yeah. Um, yes, we have a level four epilepsy center here with uh, nine or 10 epileptologists now, pediatric epileptologists. So um, any, any you know, parent who's having a difficult time um, accessing that, please feel free to contact me. But um, yeah, and we, we have um, you know, a surgical center for um, um, surgical candidates with refractory epilepsy. We have um, specialists in, for nearly every type of, of epilepsy. And we're also, we have a, a newly um, initiated epilepsy genetics clinic um, serving um, patients with rare um, genetic forms of epilepsy. So um, yes, we're, we're delighted to help um, parents of, of, and families with um, a child with rare epilepsy. Um, <clears throat> and then can you repeat the second question? Yeah, so um, so before we get to second, that second one, the first one is, so then what would, what would stop it? What, like, what would accelerate? What things would you need now clinically and experimentally that would accelerate um, the, the the translation of what you're doing into into kids. What like what would you need? What things do you need? What's what's blocking you? What's the major block right now in in this acceleration to translation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think um, I think uh, we will. You know, I think the next steps we need to do are. Uh, we'll be looking at different HDAC inhibitors and we'll be pursuing, um, you know, really um, hammering out those molecular mechanisms that are uh, underlying this, um, uh, this maladaptive uh, myelination mechanism so that we can target those specifically. So I think the faster that we can do that, um, the faster we can sort of get that into, um, you know, the final preclinical stages and then clinical trials, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Great. And these two questions are, um, checking for structural changes in the neurons that are involved in the activity dependent myelination and what's going on with them. And the related question I asked before was, how can it be that someone who's 14 and 15 and then suddenly has epilepsy didn't have any phenotype before that? Mm. So, I mean, it could be, is it possible that the neurons aren't being used and then suddenly they're used or like what's going on with the neurons, I guess is the, the kind of yeah. related question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think this is like, uh, if, if we've tried to make anything clear, it's that the neuroglial interactions are a two-way street. So uh, the neurons might change over time um, in association with, with myelin changes. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we sort of 
uh, took a look at that with electron microscopy. We looked to see if we could identify any changes in um, you know, axon diameter and, and um, features like that. And so far, we haven't found any changes, but we only looked at you know, early time points so far. Uh, there's some evidence of, you know, at, at late stages um, of epilepsy or in patients that have had um, childhood epilepsy that there um, is neurodegeneration later on. So I think it'll be uh, really interesting to look at later time points in these animal models as well. And then mm -hmm. the final question was, how, how could somebody have a sudden onset of, of epilepsy at age 14 or 15? And yeah. Um, so, it, you know, there are, as I said at the end, the epilepsies are a range of very different diseases. Um, and there are epilepsy syndromes that, that start um, at age 14 or 15. And this may be, um, you know, um, for many of them that are, you know, just sort of have this sudden onset without any provoking factor, we think that the origin is genetic. And, right. and uh, you know, it may be related to changes in ion expression or ion function. Uh, so, um, I think that's that's probably you know the answer why. So. Great. And then if you've been following Michelle's work, um, this other question, which is, is there a correlation of severe pediatric ep epilepsy and children who develop pediatric glioma? Because mm. um, you might, if you, you know, there, if there's if they're connected in some way. So it's a, it's a really interesting and important question. I will I will say a, a couple of things um, with the caveat. That that the answer is broadly, we don't know. Um, so seizures can be caused by tumors. The extent to which seizures contribute to tumors is, is a bigger question. We know that tumors develop generally when there is um, a cancer causing mutation in a susceptible cell. And so we don't think that seizures can cause tumors in the absence of that. But the question is how might the interplay between abnormally increased neuronal activity um, and, and, and tumor genesis, you know, come to pass. It's, it's becoming increasingly clear that neuronal activity drives glioma growth and that, um, in, in fact, even in susceptible cells without the right activity regulated, you know, signals that tumors maybe don't develop, at least in mice. And so, um, you know, we're trying to understand the relationship between um, abnormally increased activity and um, both tumor initiation and progression. Um, so that's that's a complicated answer to a complicated uh, question, really. But it's a very interesting one. So two more quick questions. Um, what about um, uh, secondary epilepsy and the role of activity myelination in that? Is, is it similar to the genetic or the more developmental, or is it different? Great question. I don't. I don't for sure know the answer. Um, I would think, you know, a priori, it's possible that maladaptive myelination plays a role in secondary epilepsy. So, um, you know, secondary to a head trauma, for example. Um, I would think that maybe the same principles would apply there, that seizures could induce maladaptive myelination patterns that would reinforce deleterious network activity. But I haven't tested that. But then would you propose then uh, I guess myelination protecting therapy so that you don't get this activity ab, uh, maladaptive myelination after after injury after head injury. Yeah, I think I think it's a really uh, that's a really interesting possibility um, yeah. and one that could be tested in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think you know if I Wait, if um, I had time for one more quick. Oh, go ahead. You asked what you know what 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 would help us translate to the clinic, and one one thing that would you know right. it needs a lot of work, but if we could, in a very specific way, temporarily block new oligodendrogenesis, that might be very useful in, you know, other in, in epilepsy and other diseases in which we think aberrant patterns of activity are kind of becoming or cementing a new circuit um, circuit logic. Right. Yeah. Awesome. One quick um, last question is: um, Do you see a change in epilepsy or new types of epilepsy with um, with COVID infection, um, uh, that's you know that um, uh, that we're seeing. Yeah, I think we're we're just beginning to understand uh, the the impacts of COVID. Um, so so I think um, you know uh, 
Illness in general lowers the seizure threshold. If you're already prone to seizures, um, then um, getting you know, the flu or COVID lowers your seizure, seizure threshold. Um, and so it's something that we try to avoid. We always try to um, get all of our patients vaccinated you know, with the flu vaccine every right. year. Um, so I, I think that's you know, de definitely something um, to worry about, another reason to be as careful as possible. Right. Yeah, and I think in, in, in severe COVID, when there is actually infection of the brain, which can happen, or at least has been described in some cases, is um, seizure in very severe COVID, people are having seizures, you know, probably associated with that direct brain infection. So very complex. And uh, a range of other neurological enduring effects that we're only beginning to understand. Right. Wonderful. Well, um, we're out of time. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, this used to make a lot of interesting questions. So please, um, for the audience, please reach out to, to Michelle and Juliet. Um, uh, trainees, if you'd like to uh, start with a new lab, uh, she's Juliette, so please contact her. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please join us next month for the Biodesign um, uh, Fellow. So thanks again, Michelle and Juliet, and um, thanks for everyone for joining us. Thank you.